Okay, so if everyone can hear me, um, thanks for joining us at the TCD Geography Department Lunchtime Seminar Series. And this is the final seminar of 2021. And as you just heard, it is being recorded. So please be aware. Um, we ask to keep your microphones muted and, um, you know, it's, it's your decision for the, the uh, your video. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Tommy Gavin. I'm a PhD candidate here in uh, the department as an urban geographer. Myself, Rory Rowan and Maeve Neil have been uh, building on the great work done in the previous academic year by Rory, Kathleen Stokes and Stefan Hugel. And, you know, we feel it's quite an important space to come together as a department and as a community of geographers, not least in these, uh, you know, persistently disruptive circumstances. Um, but today we're very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Susanna Pusfai, who recently joined the GeoFin team as a research fellow. Um, GeoFin is a five-year project examining the way in which Western banks penetrated Eastern Europe following the collapse of communism and how new geographies of financialization have been created in the process. Um, Dr. Pusfai has been engaged in the field of housing and housing policy for over 10 years with experience of housing policy at a local administrative scale in Hungary and France and in housing activism as well as academia. And so um, in recent years, her research has focused on the mechanisms of investment in the housing market and over in dead innocent households. So today uh, she'll be discussing first what effects the Hungarian government's post-crisis measures have had on housing finance, which is namely an entrenchment of housing market inequalities and a new house price bubble. And then secondly, what new financial mechanisms will be needed for more accessible forms of housing tenure, including community led forms of affordable housing. So um, the talk should be about 40 minutes and we'll keep 15, 20, uh, 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, you know, as the talk's going on, please throw them in the chat and then, you know, I'll, I'll group them during the Q&A um, so we can try and keep as many interventions as possible and, you know, the questions will be fresh as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's great. Over to you, Susie. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to Tommy. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start um, by sharing my screen, and then and then I'll uh, go more into discussing what. Oh, it's okay, I found it. Too many windows open. Okay, can you can you see it? I'll just make it full screen. Okay, great. Um, so, so yes, my presentation will be about uh, the financial futures of housing from above and from below. And this uh, framing of financial futures, it's also because my role in Geofin, I, I joined Geofin in uh, May. Um, and, and for the last bit of the project, actually, is the CRC run by, by uh, Martin Sokol. And, um, and so I'm working on the last uh, tranche of the project, which, uh, which is called financial futures. Um, building on the analysis of, uh, of work previously done uh, by members of the team. And uh, so that's my, well, my background actually is, uh, is a lot in, in uh, research on housing finance and, uh, and also housing activism, as, as Tommy had mentioned, and housing uh, policy work as well. But what's most relevant uh, now to, to this topic is that I had I had previously done research on the socio-spatial inequalities that are inherent to housing finance. And, uh, and then building on this experience or building on this knowledge, uh, conceptualizing how, how there could be a more progressive form of housing finance in Eastern Europe. And so within GeoFin, I'm actually working uh, on my main, my main task or my main uh, goal <laughs> as part of the project is to develop two papers on these two, two trenches, um, which I will develop in this presentation. And uh, the first one being um, how housing finance civilization developed after the 2008 crisis in Hungary and what role the government's measured, uh, measures played in that. And it's um, particularly interesting because uh, Hungary, well, among, among um, some researchers is uh, there has been this discussion whether what the Hungarian government was doing after 2010, whether that can be considered as a process of definancialization. And this is something that I will challenge in the presentation, just to <laughs> give a bit of a spoiler. But so it's, there's, there's a specificity which makes it interesting. And then the second one is on the possibilities for progressive new forms of housing finance. And, uh, and especially in the second uh, part, 
I build quite a lot on, on my practical experience beyond research experience, because in the past years we have been working uh, a lot on developing new affordable housing forms in Hungary and uh, specifically housing cooperatives, but uh, and also giving um, you know, policy recommendations to, to municipalities. And then within the work on housing cooperatives, um, there's a, an Eastern European network called MOBA housing network, which we have established, um, which also aims to become a financial intermediary on a regional scale for new affordable cooperative housing initiatives. And so in the process of developing these models, we very often come up against the financial barriers and we are also in, in negotiations with different financial actors that, that shed light very much on, on what different forms would be necessary. Um, and so this is the outline. Uh, of what I will be talking about. The first part, I, I will give a bit of context to this uh, um, discussion. Um, and then, then I will talk about these two facets, like uh, first this uh, from above element and then, and then how it looks from below if you are trying to develop new um, affordable housing mechanisms. Uh, yes, so first to start with this, uh, contextualization of what is it, uh, well, how, how I understand the more general process of housing financialization in, well, in Eastern Europe, but then I always come back to the Hungarian case because that's what I know in depth and uh, that's what most of my work has been on until now. Um, so there was, it's very interesting because just last week there was a discussion that that really came up strongly within GeoFin, within the GeoFin team about how do we call this kind of financialization that's happening in Eastern Europe? Do we call it dependent? Do we call it subordinate? Do we call it uh, peripheral, semi-peripheral, uneven financialization? So there's, there's kind of this, um, uh, well, ongoing discussion actually of, uh, of what's, what's the best way to frame it. And so the, the notions of dependent financialization, they are linked, uh, of course, to the tradition of dependency theorists and, and uh, also to world systems theory in a way. And it operates very much, of course, with this, these notions of core and periphery. And here, this is, by the way, the terminology that in previous um, work I was using, like in my PhD or in, in previous articles. Um, and, uh, and, but here, yeah, there's this challenge that um, the classical dependency theory builds a lot on, on unequal trade relations. And if you're talking about financial relations, you have to, of course, go beyond this, uh, this uh, understanding and link it in a coherent way. Um, then if you uh, think about subordinate financialization, it's uh, a lot of authors are, are using rather this terminology recently. And here there's the point of departure is more from the global money hierarchy and, and, and uh, linking to these notions of uneven and combined development, at least in the case of, of uh, Fernandez and Albers, who you all probably know. And, and here there's an interesting, or I think very important thing to highlight that there's this dichotomy of expert-led growth and, and financialization and asset price uh, increases, which are traditionally opposed to each other but that actually in, in this um, uh, situation of, of uh, financialization outside of the economic cores, these are, these are not contradictory to each other anymore and, and happen in, in um, uh, well, go hand in hand actually. Uh, and then what's also important, I think, especially in a context of, of uh, geography or in the group of geographers is, uh, to link it uh, to the notions or to the literature on uneven development and to the ideas of how these inequalities are co-constituent and are reinforced over time. Um, so there is this, you know, um, shifting between these different terminologies. And if you have any any uh, feedback on on this aspect, uh, that's very appreciated as well. Um, but what I would like to pin down is that. Uh, beyond the terminology, I think uh, all of these authors, and also in the discussion within Geofin, we were pretty much agreeing, you know, on the on the empirical baseline of what we want to talk about, which is this unequal relation and the uh, uh, a broader context of economic dependency and this um, 
this hierarchical relation be between the economic core and economic peripheries. And there's also, you know, uh, this acknowledgement that the global south is different from Eastern Europe, but uh, in the structural patterns, there are similarities. Um, and that the, the question of how housing finance uh, unrolls in, in a certain economic context, this is very much related to these relations of economic dependency. And I think that's what the main point is uh, around these different terms of dependent financialization or subordinate financialization is that that um, you know to see it as as a as a result of the structural process or, or the structural inequalities of how how uh, capitalism unrolls how financialization is happening and and that it's not just you know a, a parallel process of well it's happening differently here and differently there but that these there's there is this uh, this dependent relation um yeah i will move on i was perhaps developing that too long so uh, in practice what does this mean in the eastern european context uh on the one hand and then now i'm going to start focusing down on on housing finance so on the, the one hand it means that there's a volatility of finance and this is this is really a, a crucial characteristic of how these housing markets work um there are expectations of much faster and higher returns and the less commitment from the financial actors like you don't really have actors who would be committed in the long-term development of uh, financial instruments or of uh, of housing products let's say in this uh, uh, with this ugly word and, uh, and so the actually these housing finance tool are integrated into this this context of, of uh, economic dependency and uh, and this volatility then results in volatile housing markets it's unpredictable for households it's unpredictable for for market actors um and so there's this very strong volatility in, in the volume of capital that's available on the housing market but also in in what kind of uh, financial mechanisms are available and then this also uh, creates house price shocks like in the past years you can see that uh, statistically as well uh, there's this new rollout of, of uh, mortgages and, and new housing finance instruments since around 2015 throughout Europe. And uh, it's like Eastern European countries have been experiencing a much steeper house price increase uh, than Western European countries. And Hungary is actually at the top of that uh, hike. And, and so there's an alternation of, of periods of when capital flows abundantly onto the housing market and then when it stops abruptly and there's a lack of housing finance. And then of course the government can, you know, can do things to make the situation better or worse. The Hungarian government usually makes it worse because they step in with these pro-cyclical measures that uh, when anyway there's an abundance of capital on the market, they start pumping more money onto it and then that's what's happening now and then of course that creates these asset price bubbles and and so this lack of stability is not good for any of the actors actually and so my uh, question is whether new forms of housing tenure and new institutions could actually bring more stability and so i think that's interesting because there's of course the approach from the housing justice aspect that uh, People need housing, and they should have access to, to, to housing that they can afford. And then there's the other aspect, which is interesting, perhaps in making, making market actors interested or engaged, um, or the government or political actors interested, is that uh, actually more housing market stability would be beneficial for all actors. And so this is something that I just um, put here because uh, I was, like I said in the beginning, I was working on household debt quite a lot. And not just mortgage debt, but other kinds, but I will not talk about that part now. Um, but so in, in these countries, household debt is a very important uh, part of, of housing financialization, which is also linked to this institutional gap um, in that we don't have um, organizations or companies that would be owning and managing rental housing, for example. And uh, so we don't have institutional landlords, to put it more simply. And uh, this means that uh, a lot of uh, the money going on the housing market will be through individual mortgages. And, and because of this, loans and uh, like household loans 
they they become a very important part of how how finance utilization actually happens. And so this graph, it just shows well the, these gray bars are are the volume of uh, of household lending. Uh, cost of borrowing, and then this is when quantitative easing begins. This is just a graph that you know claims that there's a relation between quantitative easing and the and and the expansion of household lending. That actually household lending can becomes this um, sector that absorbs excess liquidity. Uh, and then there's the problem. Uh, well, or not necessarily a problem, but the situation that. Uh, there are much stricter lending criteria since the crisis, and also uh, banks are more risk adverse. And uh, so in the end, there are less households that they can lend to, but there's still this liquidity that they want to pump on the housing market. And so there's this specific pool of households, um, like middle class, uh, who, are, who can access home ownership and who, who are getting easier and easier access to, to household mortgages. And then this, the, the house the housing that they can acquire the price of these is going up and then that has an effect on the whole market um and and just one more graph to show how uh, in eastern europe household debt is really an important uh part of how how financialization rolls out here the in this graph is about the year-on-year -year evolution of outstanding mortgages so the change and uh and the yellow bars are Eastern Europe. And you can see that since 2015, uh, Eastern European countries have had the highest year-on-year -year increase in outstanding mortgages. Um, and yeah, the, this one is Southern Europe. So that's, uh, that's another, um, well, there's a bigger volatility there, let's say. Um, yes, and so actually this, this focus on household lending if we go back to before the crisis, uh, this was a, what was happening and there was a very direct form to come back to this topic of dependent financialization. Um, there was the institution of Forex loans, for foreign currency de denominated loans, which you all perhaps know about, uh, denominated in euros or in Swiss francs dispersed in Eastern European countries, but the household and the households have to repay them according to the current value of euros and uh, or Swiss francs while they have their income in the local currency. And then uh, uh, as a result of the 2008 crisis, a lot of the Eastern European currencies that were not pegged to the euro, they, uh, they, they um, dropped drastically. And so in the end, this led to this whole social and economic crisis where a lot of households went uh, bankrupt. And in Hungary, this is really a massive, massive crisis. Many households had forex loans uh, many of them are still struggling with this uh, debt overhang let's say uh, and so this situation post-crisis led to this shifting landscape of how housing financialization rolls out and uh, i think one very interesting aspect that is often overlooked are, are debt collector companies which are um, large international actors that have since the 2008 crisis they have very much uh, increased their activities in Eastern European and Southern European countries, and they, they kind of spell out the geography of the crisis, I think. Uh, another blind sp spot is the growth in consumer loans, which are uh, the number of consumer loans is growing much faster than mortgage loans, and, uh, and there's also a growth in the volume, like in, in, the, in the amount that you can get as a consumer loan. And often households who, who are not eligible for a mortgage, but uh, still need to solve their housing situation somehow, they will take a large sum consumer loan, which of course has worse conditions uh, than a mortgage. So that's uh, in a nutshell about the, the context of, of housing financialization in Eastern Europe. And now I will um, go on to talk about the, the well, what, the financial future of housing from above and what the Hungarian government has been doing since 2008. Uh, so um, there was there were very strong uh, government interventions after the 2008 crisis because of this big um, forex um, loan crisis. And there were some quite, I will not go into all the things that were done at that time, but uh, it did, have the effect, and this is where the claims of 
definancialization in Hungary come from, it did have the effect of, of breaking this um, very direct foreign independency in terms of housing. Finance. Or actually, I have a slide that will explain that a bit more. Um, and then uh, since 2015, there's this housing market revival that is very, that, well, it's happening everywhere <laughs> it's, uh, on the market. But in Hungary, it's, uh, it's being spurred very much by the government. They introduced this, uh, mm, this very large scale program of providing subsidies and subsidized loans as well. They could go in pair to middle income uh, families according to the number of children they have. This is a poster for this kind of uh, subsidy plus loan uh, instrument. So it's geared towards uh, middle class families. Uh, and it has this very strong natalist perspective in it as well. Um, and you can even get it if you promise to have children in the future. And then if you don't, you have to start paying it back. And then beside the subsidy, there are also these very favorable loans that you can have access to, but only if you're married and have children. Um, and then beyond uh, this financial push towards, towards middle-class households, there's also a, a very big push in the construction industry and they are uh, supporting new development, uh, new residential developments. But then of course, these, there's nothing done for these new developments to be affordable in any way. So it's actually just, uh, and they also introduced this tax benefit for, for real estate companies if they engage in residential buildings. Uh, so my claim is, and I will go into more detail in just a bit, that the financial logic continues to dominate in the in the sphere of housing, but there has uh, the the scope of beneficiaries has been shifted, both on the on the um, on the level of uh, market actors, and on the level of households. And uh, so there's a like this polarized, a dualist housing finance system that has I'm sorry that has developed which um, where there are new kind of mortgage loans which are quite safe because they are super regulated since uh, 2008 uh, that can be accessible to uh, social groups who are favored by these government policies um, and to have good employment conditions. And then the other financial instruments are left a lot less regulated. And so all of those households who fall out of this narrower circle, they, they turn to these other kinds of financial instruments, which is one of the reasons of why the growth in person, personal loans and consumer lending has been growing very fast. And so this results actually in positioning local elites and domestic companies in housing finance. So there are a number of instruments such as taking the banking sector into domestic ownership. 90% of the banking sector was in foreign ownership between, before 2008, and now this is below 50 and there has like uh, domestic economic elites have gotten very favorable uh, state subsidized huge loans for buying out the international banks. There has also been regulatory um, coercion towards uh, international financial institutions, pushing them to sell their um, shares to, to domestic actors. Uh, there, there's been a regulatory ban on Forex loans. Um, these housing subsidies that I mentioned on the previous slide, they are channeled through banks. So you go to the bank to ask for this housing subsidy. And then of course, in, in many cases, uh, you can't really leave without also taking a loan. And this is not you know, set as a rule anywhere, anywhere but uh, this is the, the material interest of the banks, of course. And then in the construction sector and real estate industry, there are these olig oligopolistic relations and uh, and the preference for domestic companies and not only domestic, but companies who are somehow loyal to the government. Um, and so there has been the domestic economic elites have been positioned in the past years in, in key unmovable sectors. And of course, housing and real estate are very important in that. And as, an, or as a prerequisite in the financial industry is also very important. And so this is from a paper, there's a, Another, like a Hungarian author called, called David Karas, who, who has done very, very nice research specifically on, on how, um, well, what's going on in terms of financialization in, in Hungary, and also reacting in part to these, to these arguments on, on definancialization. 
and it, he's been taking a look generally on all kinds of, of policy interventions in economic spheres, not only housing. And his argument is that there has been a reactive channel that has been trying to, you know, um, cut uh, certain economic uh, relations or economic dependencies um, that are economically or politically not favorable for the government. And there's been a proactive channel that has built new financial verticals and new, new kinds of financialized circuits that would benefit um, those uh, interest groups that the government wants to benefit. And so here I have just circled and read the ones that are, are more closely linked to the processes uh, related to housing finance that I was talking about. And so there were all these interventions after the crisis uh, linked to, to private debt and to retail banking and especially to the presence of foreign creditors and uh, the same of reducing Forex uh, loans. Um, oh, sorry. And, uh, and the bailouts and debt reconversion of households. Uh, and then uh, as a next step, there has been this proactive channel that has strengthened the financial circuits. Uh, I was previously talking about uh, for, for households and also for, um, for eco different, different economic actors. And so just to develop a bit more on these arguments, there's um, this question of definancialization. And um, so actually evidence suggests that there isn't this financial freedom fight going on, but uh, strengthening authoritarianism in Hungary and deepening financialization have gone hand in hand. And the uh, financialization has been deepened in a way to strengthen the economic and political position of the government. And it has, and it's, it's quite, you know, uh, put together in a, in a, in a quite uh, complex way. Um, and so in the field of housing, you can, like, if you only look at this very, very direct link of dependency that Forex mortgages mean and foreign bank ownership, this link has been, has been severed and has been, has been very much reduced. But at the same time, there, the, the other mechanisms that have been introduced have generated this domestic asset price bubble. And it's also the basis for new rentier bargains. Um, and uh, yeah, and so this creates this new financial vertical that I was talking about, uh, where housing and housing finance uh, play this very important role actually, because it's on the one hand, the way of securing an, uh, a voter base uh, among the middle class uh, and of um, strengthening um, economic elite uh, that is, is crucial in the economic stability. Uh, of, of uh, the government and, uh, and at the same time, it kind of controls those who do not have access or those social groups who do not have access to these, uh, to these benefits. And this creates this synergetic feedback loop and within this nationalized form of financialization. Uh, and definancialization is only happening in, in very limited domains where this is the economic interest of, of the economic elites. Uh, and I'm just realizing that I don't have so much time, um, but I will try to go through this third part quickly on the financial futures of housing from below. And so uh, my argument is, and I will not go into this in detail, that individual mortgages have very important limitations. Uh, basically that my claim is that uh, mortgages are still not accessible and not affordable to many. And then that's a different argument that even if they would be, I don't think that it's a good uh, solution since in the long term it increases inequalities. Of course, if, uh, if there's a housing structure that is only geared towards home ownership. And this is, I think, one of the fundamental problems of Eastern European housing markets are so much geared towards individual home ownership and the, the increase of mortgages. Um, and this is not going to create a solution to the housing problems of, of uh, large social groups. Um, and so I think uh, some forms of housing finance are very direly missing. And to put it in generic terms, this is uh, patient finance that, is, that would be available in long-term with low interest rates and long-term housing purpose funding to organizations and not to individuals. And this is something that I think from Ireland probably seems quite trivial that uh, 
nonprofit corporations and housing organizations should have access to long-term cheap finance. But this, is, this does not exist at all in Eastern Europe. And I think this is a, the, one of the most important bottlenecks for, um, for new forms of affordable housing to be able to develop. Uh, and uh, so of course this would have a social benefit and then also the more broad um, housing market stabilizing benefit that I mentioned before. Uh, and so just to turn, you know, turn the argument around a little bit, I also think that housing finance could become an enabler for these new uh, housing institutions. And, uh, and so just to, to be more specific about it, what I mean by new housing institutions, on the one hand, institutionally owned affordable rental housing, that is um, housing associations um, and, and similar organizations which do not exist in the region. Uh, and I think without uh, these kind of organizations, the, the expansion in volume of affordable housing is not uh, realistic. And the kind of patient finance um, that would be available to them is, uh, is a prerequisite for this. Uh, and then housing cooperatives are, are a kind of form that uh, have a historical precedent in the region and the uh, ownership-based cooperatives exist, but uh, this is still not accessible to people who cannot access individual ownership. So this needs to be you know, expanded to rental-based cooperatives as well. Uh, and then just to highlight a few potential financial mechanisms more specifically, uh, on the one hand, there are, of course, the government subsidies and government loan-based instruments, and now also um, the European uh, loan-based instruments. Uh, and another interesting thing to explore, I think, are bottom-up self-managed funds and community financing, which are more like these last two are more unconventional forms of affordable finance. Um, but I think, especially in our context, they are important to, to explore as well. And I will not talk about government subsidies uh, and government uh, subsidized loans because I think that is quite straightforward and, and that's, uh, well, it would be straightforward. And for it to start happening, there also needs to be a push from below and also from policy experts. Uh, and so now to maybe to go on to, to these European instruments, which uh, it's also very relevant now because there's the new financial framework is, is starting to be rolled out now and, and many of it is our loan based instruments which can be seen as a as a, a, a worse situation or a step back compared to compared to grant based instruments but I think that in the field of housing actually they can be used uh, quite smartly because it is the kind of affordable um, long term finance that we are looking for. Uh, but here there are a number of, of obstacles for small housing organizations to actually be able to use them. And one of them, uh, which is in Hungary, especially an obstacle that it's very hard to get around the nation state because most instruments are channeled through local governments. Then there's the problem of the capacities of housing organizations, which are often uh, small. Uh, and there's this catch 22 that they can't become bigger as long as they don't have access to adequate financial instruments, but they don't have access to adequate financial instruments as long as they are small. So this somehow needs to be overcome. Uh, reducing the minimum loan packages and financial intermediaries to be trained about the specifics of, of housing in, in Eastern Europe. Then a, a few words about what I mean by a community managed bottom up fund. This is an experience that we are developing within mobile housing network, uh, this Eastern European network I had mentioned in the beginning. And this fund, it would be operated on the level of MOBA and it would acquire finance from different uh, sources that you can see on this side. And then it would uh, give out loans to members and potentially also guarantees. Uh, and this is set up already it's very small at the moment but this year we will be doing a lot of work to expand it and to attract new investment into it so we're quite excited about that and then this issue of community finance and um, this is um, mm, well it's a, an experience that we have in in two different uh, budapest based uh, organizations uh, of how actually it came out of a necessity because we, we wanted to have access to, to you know, a proper bank loan, but we couldn't. And so we started using community finance, like asking for loans from people in our network. And actually 
these are two real estate projects. One is housing, this one that you see as a community space. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, these projects were financed to a very large extent with this kind of, of uh, direct uh, lending. And, uh, and in the end, it turned out that this is quite a nice thing because it's a way to mobilize community through their financial involvement. And it's a, a way of, of complement, or well, it kind of acts as equity. Uh, and because it is not, well, I will not go into the technical details now, but it can be complemented also with a loan and it kind of um, it can buffer for this lack, lack of long-term finance because it can kind of artificially lengthen uh, um, the loans that you would otherwise have, but it puts a lot of risk on, on the organization that is taking the loan. And I just have two summarizing slides. One is about and how these bottlenecks should be overcome. And uh, I think all kinds of different actors have a role to play in this. I think the role of the state is what is very often mentioned. And of course, it is uh, inevitable in the field of housing. But I think it's interesting to explore what role market actors could also have. And, uh, and I think there are a number of things that could be done. And the role of housing organizations, uh, which kind of need to create this pressure from below. And then to come back to the financial aspect, I really think there is a financial innovation needed for more, um, well, for the housing situation to, to improve a bit in Eastern Europe. And um, in practice, this means all these things I was talking about before, longer term loans to be accessible, financing to nonprofit entities and also to smaller actors. And then there's always this big question of how to scale up beyond pilot projects because there are quite a lot of very nice pilot projects in different Eastern European countries. But then for these to scale up, I think we really need to build robust institutions and to have, have secure financial channels that you can count on that they will be there in five years and 10 years as well. And the, for this, of course, we need an enabling policy environment as well. And uh, just to be a little bit op optimistic, I think there might be a potential opportunity in the current moment because there's this economic instability also linked to COVID and the ensuing economic crisis. And this also reduces, well, it, it kind of creates a situation where perhaps um, financial actors are willing to experiment a bit more. They are pushed to individuals cannot access mortgages that much. They are also kind of pushed uh, to engage perhaps more in these kind of alternative solutions. And of course the need is always there. Uh, and at the same time, there's this big liquidity on financial markets that um, that can perhaps, but maybe this is too naive, you know, but can perhaps be channeled into these kind of more progressive solutions. So thank you. And uh, I will stop sharing so that I can see everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, and um, if, if people want to, to write questions into the chat box, I can group them or read them out. And if there's not a, a ton of questions, then maybe actually um, people can uh, pose them directly and have more of a conversational uh, thing. But um, I'm always very struck, particularly, I suppose, hearing from you know, research from Geofin, but um, you know, how, how like uh, familiar, you know, um, uh, it can sound hearing about um these kind of like contextual factors or situations about kind of um crises in and housing and you know uh sometimes some of the the um you know contextual situations you know you, you think of them as being you know particularly irish maybe but you know you hear uh about you know say whether it's um particularly maybe in hungarian situation as you described where you have you know the uh the rentier bargain where you have uh you know the uh solutions being subsidized home ownership targeted at voter bases um um and then even like some of the the more recent historical factors with you know kind of domestic ownership of the banking sector oligopolistic relations in real estate and construction sectors um and uh and a private rental sector dominated by small landlords. Like those are things that just like, you know, some people would even like characterize as, you know, typically Irish in the, the uh, housing situation. 
And so I thought that was very interesting. Um, so maybe to, to start off, um, could you maybe elaborate more on um, what that discourse of definancialization was or is? Um, well, I'm, I'm a bit, um, you know, I'm troubled with that because that is not my 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 research. <laughs> it is mainly uh, linked, uh, well, to to other researchers working on on, on Eastern Europe. Mm. Uh, well, what was what was the kind of argument, or what was that? The, well, the, the argument is that uh, that since uh, the, there were these measures, you know, that uh, of taking over the banking sector after the 2008 crisis and taking it into domestic ownership and the, the banning of uh, forex mortgages and also there were different debt cancellation mechanisms put in place specifically for handling this forex mortgage crisis situation that these were actually signs of, of definancialization and then beyond housing there were also other measures such as um, I know uh, shifting uh, the shifting state debt also to domestic um, to domestic lenders and uh, uh, both uh, well there is this big large scale household program also where, where households can invest into into uh, government bonds um, and so all of these have actually resulted in a shift um, and uh, but I think I think that the main difference in in our arguments is that. Um, it's not, I would not say that this is definancialization. This is like a, a decoupling of, of domestic financial processes in certain spheres from uh, these very direct international dependencies and international linkages. But there's still like this very deep process of financialization going on domestically. And also the kind of these, the international dependencies, perhaps in housing finance, they were altered, but in other spheres of the economy, such as the um, the well, productive sector, I know automobile industry, uh, not at all. Um, and there's in other, in other sectors of the economy, there is still this very clear international dependency uh, that is still happening. So I think it's not like to, to claim it to be definancialization is like, you know, reducing financialization to a certain aspect, which is like direct international dependency and finance. And I think it's broader than that. Mm. Rory, do you have a question? I do. Uh, thanks, Tommy. Uh, thanks, Susie. That was super interesting. So I guess, um, feeding on from Tommy's comment on your answer there, um, like there's also this, the striking similarities with Ireland at one point in your talk, you were like, it may seem kind of <laughs> a basic assumption in Ireland. I was like, no, <laughs> we don't have that here. This is not a Switzerland or Austria or something. But, um, and also kind of wary of kind of the othering of Hungary that we see in, in the Irish media discourse as, as well as I think Western European uh, discussion. I mean, one of my co question concerns is the nature of the Hungarian state specifically in its peculiar structure and say um both in as far as the state is a kind of source of the problems a bind up which, which you're pointing to but also it's its necessity as you pointed to to some degree as being an agent in, in making solutions so i mean and, and you know when you're talking about this the the nature of definancialization and it's kind of possibly kind of mythic it's like rather a refinancialization or respatialization of financialization which is very in keeping it seems to me with the kind of illiberal democracy of, uh, of the Hungarian uh, administration in this kind of sense of it's kind of a, a nationalization of financialization. So you kind of have an anti-globalist kind of agenda put into the sphere of finance, but you have a pro-capitalist and authoritarian um, version of, of what, what supporting the nation means. So I, I guess like a, it's more of an open question, but how much this so rather than the kind of similarities, which are very strong to the Irish case, in fact, actually, I'm sure to other contexts, what about the, the specificity of the nature of the, the, the Hungarian state under urban? And how is this? Obviously, it's, it's mapping very neatly against the, the, the kind of post-crisis phase. Um, and how much do you find this is an obstacle um, in, in terms of those solutions that you were looking at? Those that involve the kind of state funding finances or funding mechanisms can we have kind of housing change within the state structure or does there need to be a change to the state structure kind of before or coterminous and higher, higher you know if, if you get what i'm getting at there it's quite a large question i guess yes i will try to take it by bits <laughs> thanks for that so um first 
the similarities to Ireland, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very glad you pointed that out because I think that Ireland can also be seen as a semi-peripheral economy in Europe in many ways. And actually, um, in, like previously, when I was looking at statistical data uh, on a European scale, I would put, and I doing these country groupings of like core and the uh, semi-periphery and I would put Ireland in the peripheral group, or actually it was this out, outlier always, and then I would have Eastern Europe and Southern Europe plus Ireland, which kind of looks weird, but it was because of this kind of, of, uh, of structural similarity and also the kind of the nature of the housing boom before the crisis was very similar to that in Southern Europe. So, so yeah, thanks a lot for pointing that out, and I completely agree. Um, yeah. And uh, and then what's the similarity and what's the specificity of the of the Hungarian context as compared to that? Well, I really think it's useful to think about it as these different facets of refinancialization and definancialization. And um, what I think is specific is in Hungary is that since 2010, the government has managed to take over many sectors of the state and of the economy. Um, and uh, and there, through this, they have really achieved like a very, you know, in a way, very coordinated uh, intervention in different spheres and different sectors. And if you have, if you don't have a government that has a super, has super majority in the parliament, then it's much more difficult to do these things. And Fidesz has over two thirds uh, in the past ten years, and this has allowed them to intervene in in uh, a number of of um, segments of the state uh, that would have otherwise not been possible. And and I think in order to put together this. Um, uh, you know, these different interventions that then kind of uh, support each other. Uh, it's, uh, it's necessary to have this kind of, uh, um, yeah, regulatory power, actually. Uh, and that's maybe a specificity, because then, actually, I think, in the broader picture, it's not so particular. And now, uh, with the COVID crisis, then, like, a few years ago, the, the monetary policy of Hungary was coined very unorthodox, but now other central banks are starting to introduce very similar measures. So I think it's not outstanding so much or like the um, different government measures to support the home ownership of middle class families. That's also something that a huge number of governments are doing. Um, and maybe not, you know, not in such an absurd way that it's according to the number of children you have, but still they, there, are, there are many countries where you have these kind of policies. So, so maybe the specificity is just that it's being rolled out, you know, in a very aggressive way and without, uh, without really consideration for any other kind of social actors um, uh, who could, who could uh, influence uh, the way these are being developed. And so the possibility of change, um, I think there are some parts of it which can be, you know, developed maybe in parallel, for example, with our cooperative housing initiatives, we have these discussions with some market actors and looking at how per perhaps um, there could be, and there's an increasing interest in, in, in some kind of uh, socially and environmentally sustainable um, investment goals which i know are often very you know slippery ground but but still i think here there are some minor possibilities in the sphere of housing of like uh, doing things without the government also local municipalities present some kind of possibility um, and there are many many oppositional uh, municipalities in hungary like the the budapest municipality and and uh, most of the districts are also um, governed by by more well more socially sensitive political forces and we have some, quite a few cooperations uh, on different levels but municipalities at the same time have very very limited financial resources and um, and so in the end in the end to achieve big changes uh, I, I think there has to be some kind of shift on on the governmental level but in the meantime you know you can you can develop models that work and, and you can build up institutions and you can start collaborations with, with uh, European actors, with market actors, with municipalities, with other housing organizations. And that kind of starts to build a web um, that, that can change, change the narrative, for example, and, and create possibilities. Thanks. Uh, and you, um, you mentioned kind of the, the entry into the housing sector maybe of um 
kind of debt collector um, funds. Is that fair to call them? Debt collector funds. Or companies, or yeah. Companies, yeah. And so it was like, um, my question, I suppose, is, uh, you know, comparatively, again, with Ireland, maybe that there has been um, the, the entry in the last couple of years, maybe since 2018, of, you know, real estate investment trusts. And this is kind of the, the foothold for, you know, um, corporate landlords um, into the Irish um, rental sector, particularly. Um, and I guess my question is, so that, you know, colloquially referred to as, as vulture funds. Um, well, so that there was kind of a, the, the purchasing of distressed assets, you know, and, um, which uh, was part of this, um, this phase from 2017, 2018, where real estate investment trusts then followed on maybe. So it's, you know, the, the real estate investment trusts aren't necessarily what you call the vulture funds of purchasing distressed assets and then selling them on. But, um, you know, my question is like, do, do you see, uh, I think Susie disappeared. Oh, I think we might have lost Susie there. Huh. <laughs> How do we get her back? Look. She'd had enough of us. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I, oh. I dropped out, but uh, sorry. sorry. So yeah, my, sorry. My, my, my question briefly was about uh, you know, is there a potential or is from the development of debt collector companies into something more financialized or is it purely just you know eviction companies mm. um well it's more the latter I, I i think it could be you know interesting to uh, this is like a, people usually think it's a very strange idea but to engage in conversation with them i think uh but uh well, I don't think like in the short term, no, there's no possibility because actually they acquire these debts, but then they don't want to manage housing. Like they, and we come back to this problem of the lack of any kind of actor that would be willing and capable to manage housing in the long term. And, and so actually these debt collector companies as well, they could have the potential because they get a lot of properties actually in their hands. And there would be the possibility of them, I'd know, creating... Um, uh, a real estate company actually the biggest hungarian bank did this they had their own like in-house uh, debt collector company and then they created this in-house real estate company but even there they don't manage properties in the long term it's only meant for for reselling quite quickly um so no the short answer is no they don't do this uh, i think there could be such a possibility and and uh, it would be interesting to find such an actor potentially but um, but it's not in their it's not in their mode of functioning. Um, we're nearly at the hour. I guess if um, if there's no more questions, I would actually like to if you know push it to to five past maybe quickly ask you about um, your experience with uh, AVM Averroes Mendenki, the City is for All, um, and kind of what that group is or has been or is about, and then. Um, and then also uh, your experience with the um, the um, uh, perfor um, Perifidia Center. <laughs> exactly. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. So actually, we um, we've met with uh, Tommy not at Trinity but through housing activist groups uh, several years back, and um, and it, well, I was engaged for for eight or nine years in this group called Cities for All in Budapest, and uh, which is, um, well, a rather classical housing activist group uh, stepping up against evictions and, uh, and pushing for policy change. And I'm no longer active in this um, since 2017, more or less. But, um, well, the interesting, um, or what was novel in the Hungarian context when we started this group in 2009 
was to uh, organize those affected by the housing crisis. And then, of course, the difficulty is that there are very different social groups affected by the housing crisis and how do you build alliances between them? Or that's something that I think the whole like broader, broadly defined housing movement in Hungary is struggling with, that there are very few actors and in places where, where, where the movement aspect is also more developed. I know in Germany, for instance, you have specific housing movement groups for every kind of social group that has a housing problem, and then everyone can find their own community, and then they form an alliance and push together for, for housing policy changes. Um, and, and so here you have a housing movement that kind of tries to take on a number of different roles, and then, and then this, this makes a, a everyday organizing difficult. Um, but I think the fact that there has been a massive change around the issue of housing in Hungary in the past 10 years. And by now, it's a really an acknowledged thing that there is a housing crisis, that there's something should be done about this, and that oppositional parties that we will have elections in April, uh, and none of the oppositional parties think that they can afford not to talk about the housing crisis. And they are now consulting us on a regular basis, actually. And so this is the result. Uh, I think very much of, of the like more than 10 year activism of this housing group. And then also, of course, of the changing context that in the past years, um, housing has become a problem for social groups for whom before it was not. And I think this is also a global phenomenon. And this is, and, and well, globally, housing movements have become more important in the past years and their voices are becoming heard a lot more because well, you know, to be ironic, I think it's also because the middle class is starting to feel the housing crisis on its own skin. And then, of course, the middle class is more vocal politically. Uh, so, so that's uh, mm, what's going on now. And, or, well, this is the maybe story of, of this group that Tommy was asking about very, very briefly. And then Periferia Policy and Research Center is an organization that we founded with a few people with whom we have been working together for a long time. Um, it's a, a critically engaged, small, well, let's say think tank, um, but uh, without the bad connotations, we do research, we do policy work, and we do like support to social movements. And now, for example, next year, we are planning to have a, a joint project with, uh, with this aforementioned housing activist group around the issue of housing debt and to do some kind of action research. And we also, we produce a lot of materials that are not academic, but you know, kind of aim to, to well, talk about complicated things in an understandable way, talk about depth, talk about finance civilization in an accessible way. So uh, that's what we do there. And uh, I will type our website in the chat and you can check it out if you want. And I will also type the other one, the name of the housing activist group is that and uh, this is their website they are hosted by one of them so yeah i don't know if you want me to go into anything more in detail tommy um well it's it's uh it's five past two now so i guess um people have to head off so i'll just yeah. say thanks thanks a million for uh for coming to speak to us and I'll quickly say that on uh, January 26th, we'll be joined for the next seminar by Professor Kate Spencer, Professor of Environmental Geochemistry at Queen Mary University London. So that'll be the next lunchtime seminar. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye and uh, nice holidays. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. I'll stop the recording.